Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Talk of the Stacks. I'm Christy Pearson with Friends of the Hennepin County Library. As a library's nonprofit fundraising partner, we build awareness, appreciation, and financial resources for our nationally acclaimed library system. Well, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to our first virtual event here in the, for the award-winning series, Talk of the Stacks. Thank you so much for joining us live from your living rooms. We so miss seeing all of your smiling faces, but we know we'll be together again sometime soon. I'd also like to thank our wonderful sponsors, US Bank and the Star Tribune for their awesome support in helping bring the best of the literary world to our library friends. Well, tonight we are thrilled to welcome novelist and fan favorite, Larry Watson. But before we begin, I'd like to share an update about our resilient and forward-thinking library. In recent weeks, our community has called out for educational resources about the history of racism in this country, as well as the remarkable heritage and accomplishments of people of color. In June, the library responded by making the most popular anti-racist eBooks available for all for immediate download through August 31st. And they will soon be increasing access to more than 700 eBooks with a particular emphasis on young adults and children's titles. Now, many of us are hungry to learn and to grow and our library is determined to meet this moment with action. So if you believe in the power of knowledge in the face of injustice, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. Every dollar you donate makes a difference by funding instant downloads and decreasing hold times on the most popular eBooks. So to help us meet our quarter of a million dollar goal, simply visit our website or use the link in the chat bar. So thanks so much for your consideration. And now I would like to invite events manager Rob Gowdy to the screen to offer a few additional instructions and to introduce tonight's special guest. Thank you all so much for being with us. We're delighted you're here. Good evening, and thank you so much, Christy. I do have a couple quick announcements before we invite Mr. Watson to the screen. First, if you enjoy tonight's talk and want to purchase a copy of the brand new book, The Lives of Edie Pritchard, click the link in the chat. By purchasing your copy through local bookseller Majors and Quinn, you are helping our local literary community thrive. Thank you. Next, if you would like to ask the author a question, either about the new book or his life or past writings, click the icon on the bottom center of the screen marked Q&A anytime throughout the talk. You can also like questions that others have submitted by hitting the thumbs up to increase the likelihood that they will be asked. I'll be back later to moderate a conversation with the author, so make sure to submit your questions for inclusion in this discussion. And now it's my honor to introduce our esteemed guest. Larry Watson is the author of 11, 11 critically acclaimed novels, including the bestseller, Monta Montana 1948. His books have received numerous prizes and awards, including the National Fiction Prize awarded by local publisher, Milkweed Press. A film adaptation of Watson's novel, Let Him Go, featuring Kevin Costner and Diane Lane is due to release this fall. So here to discuss his new novel, The Lives of Edie Pritchard, it's my pleasure to welcome Larry Watson to Talk of the Stacks. Thanks, Rob. Oops, I lost. Oh, okay. Got you back. <laughs> so uh, thank you to the Hennepin County Library for inviting me again to participate in Talk of the Stacks. And thank all of you for being, being where you are. I've come to realize how much of occasions like this is connected to place. Thanks for coming. It's good to be here. I'm glad we're all here together. And I haven't quite figured out what the equivalents are for a virtual meeting, since now we get together in time rather than space, but one dimension is better than none. So anyway, thank you for your interest and support. Uh, before I begin, I wanna say something about uh, Minneapolis and my writing career. My publicist, my publicist sent me copies of two very nice reviews that appeared in the Minneapolis and St. Paul papers and she wrote along with it, you really have fans there, Larry. Well, if that's true, 
there are two reasons. First is the abundance of friends and family that I have here. And second, Emily Buckwald and Milkweed Editions. When Emily published Montana 1948 back in 1993, she made all the other books possible, and I mean that both in terms of my writing and of the interest in what I've written. So thank you, Twin Cities. I owe you everything. As I said, I've participated in this event once before the occasion then was the publication of my novel, Let Him Go. It was a great evening. I shared the stage with John Pineda, another novelist, and our moderator was Daniel Slager, who'd been the editor for both John's novel and mine. We had a really lively discussion. Back then, I was still teaching. And while I've since retired, I still have enough classroom in me to announce before we get started what the format will be for the evening. I'm gonna talk a little, read a little, talk a little more, and then that should get us to the part of the evening that I'm most looking forward to, and that's the conversation with you. And Rob has promised that he'll guide us through that part. So what I'll try to do this evening is to address two subjects that readers often ask about. They wanna know where I get my ideas, and they wanna know about my writing process. And I'll try to speak to both concerns and do so almost simultaneously since they seem to me inextricably entwined. For me, an idea for a novel is only part of the process. I have to figure out what to do with that idea. I've had any number of ideas for novels that never came to be or resulted in failure because I couldn't find the right answers to technical matters of structure or voice or point of view, or maybe especially what will be included and what will be left out. So the examples I'll use in talking about these matters will be from the lives of Edie Pritchard. For me, any discussion of the writing process proceeds from my years of teaching, specifically teaching freshman English. Early in my classroom career, there was a kind of revolution in writing instruction. Instead of simply telling students to write an essay or a research paper or a book review or any other familiar classroom assignment, we tried to impart to students what other writers typically did when they wrote. And we did this with the hope that students would be helped by understanding and perhaps following the steps in that process. Many, many educators and theorists contributed significantly to this approach. One of my favorites was Donald Murray, who was both a teacher and a practicing writer. Murray and others broke the writing process down into parts or stages. And generally those stages were pre-writing, writing, and rewriting. And there were many different activities that might belong to each stage. Those of you who have taught writing will be familiar with this approach to instruction. Those of you who are writers will be familiar with the steps, though you probably just call it writing. As Murray acknowledged, the process is individualistic and messy, and though he and others presented it as a series of steps, he said there should be nothing rigid about it. My visual aid for the process was not a ladder, one step leading to another, but a Mobius strip, something recursive and often turning back on itself. That's, that's enough about theories of composition. Let me discuss how a novel might happen for me. And as I said, I'll use the lives of Edie Pritchard as an example, typical in many respects, and I'll try to use the writing of that novel as illustrative of the process. So here I'm shifting now to the where do I get my ideas question. In a recent essay I wrote for the Algonquin Reader, a collection my publisher puts out about recent books and their background, I mentioned that my family is rife with twins. My great grandfather was a twin, my mother was a twin, my aunt and uncle, my nephew and my niece, all twins, and all of these courtesy of my maternal grandmother, Sigurd Fiskachen, who gave birth to two sets of twins. And I've often included twins in my fiction, but they've mostly been there as an homage to my family. But in the back of, the mind, in the back of my mind, I kept holding on to the thought that maybe someday I could explore twins at greater depth, especially because I thought they'd work well for a theme that's always interested me. And that's the theme of identity, especially confusions of identity. 
but I didn't really have a situation that seemed as though it might work as something to be developed into a novel. And my wife and I had an experience at a bookstore event that I thought just might give me my story. Because the bookstore shared a space with an excellent restaurant, the bookstore owner hosted a dinner with perhaps 20 guests invited from the community. Before the dinner, I read a bit from the novel I was there to promote, and then we settled down to an excellent meal. Coffee and dessert had just been served, and the bookstore owner came over to me and said, I could begin my presentation at any time. Presentation? I thought I'd done all the presentation, presenting I came to do. The novel I was discussing was largely concerned with the consequences of teenage misbehavior. It was American Boy. So I said, well, why don't we go around the table and each of us will say what was the scariest or stupidest or most embarrassing thing we did as a teenager, or all three. Really, I was just stalling for time, but to my surprise, everyone was willing to contribute something scary or stupid or both. Some really great stories were exchanged that evening, but the anecdote that made the greatest impression on me was not the most dramatic or the funniest or the most frightening. An older gentleman told about having been an exchange student in Japan when he was in high school. He fell in love with a girl over there, but she was a twin and he was never sure which sister was the one he loved. His story got a big laugh, though I had my doubts. If you're in love with someone, wouldn't you be able to identify that person no matter what? If you loved a blade of grass or a pebble, wouldn't you be able to pick out that blade of grass or that pebble from all the others? but that was probably the moment when I thought I might have found my plot. That was two books before the lives of Edie Pritchard, but that's not unusual for me. I get an idea that feels as though it has promise and years might pass before I have the other elements I need to begin putting words on paper. During that time, the original idea might very well undergo some changes. This, of course, is a pre-writing stage for me. And while I might make a few notes in my journal, it's just as likely that all of it will take place in my head. In fact, I won't begin writing the novel itself until I have a first sentence. I'll have made some other decisions before writing that sentence, decisions about setting in both time and place, about characters, about point of view, perhaps decisions about structure and shape and I'll have found a voice or style for the novel, and that will find it, its expression in that opening sentence. When this sentence is right, or seems to be, it feels as though the entire novel has just been waiting behind that sentence. And once I write it, the rest will take care of itself. Which of course is a great delusion, but that's okay. It's the feeling that I want. And with the writing of that sentence, I'll have moved from pre-writing to writing. My hope is that I'll write the entire novel one sentence after another, and sometimes the process has proceeded almost exactly in that way. And yet I'm not finished at all at this point with the activities that go on in the pre-writing stage, the planning the, and the brainstorming, because I don't know what will be in this novel beyond the first pages or first section or scene. The rehearsing, because I'm more or less constantly trying out language as it will be in the novel. But if I haven't finished the pre-writing stage once I start writing, I've also jumped ahead to the rewriting stage. I write word by word and sentence by sentence, and I'm constantly checking my word choice. I use the dictionary and the, and the thesaurus frequently to make sure that the word means what I think it means, and to see if there's a synonym that might be a better choice. It's not often that a sentence makes the cut on the first try, but I'm moving so slowly and carefully at this stage because I want to do as little revising as possible. And maybe I should add that once I start the actual writing, I am for the most part composing on the computer keyboard. I used to write everything by hand, and then type it, yes, type it on a typewriter, or put it into the computer. That seemed like a workable method to me. It was slow, but then I've never been convinced that speed is of the essence when it comes to writing fiction. And this is probably a good time to turn to the actual novel itself. I'm gonna read a few pages and then I'll talk a little bit 
about what that original idea morphed into. I'm going to read the novel's opening pages. The action takes place in 1967. Roy Linderman and Edie Linderman, she's married to Roy's twin brother, Dean, are on the road driving from their hometown of Gladstone, Montana to Bent Rock, Montana, where Roy plans to purchase a truck. Edie is driving along to drive Roy's car back home. Sunlight glints off the slope of the hood like a snowdrift, and Roy Linderman puts on his sunglasses. Like a man born to drive, he lets one arm hang out the window of his Chevy Impala while the other rests on top of the steering wheel to keep the big car in line. The air flowing through the car is as hot as the August wind blowing across the prairie. And to make himself heard above the rush and the steady rumble of the Chevy, Roy raises his voice. How do you know it isn't the flu, he asks. Maybe we'll all get it. My aunt in Bozeman is a nurse, Edie says. And she says, it's almost always something people ate. And what makes you so sure it was the hot dog? Please, sitting all day in that greasy water, it was the hot dog. And you didn't eat one, so you're safe? That's right, Edie says, I'm safe. When we were kids, Roy says, whatever was going around, he got measles, mumps, chicken pox. Like maybe with twins, only one of us had to get it. And Dean would be the one, and it had passed me by. Strep throat, tonsillitis. He had his tonsils out, and I still got mine. I remember when he had strep. Edie gives her head a rueful little shake. I remember that very well. I wonder if maybe you did, Roy says. On every side of them, nothing rises more than knee high, and the wheat grass, needle grass, blue grama and fescue, all the color of a sweat-stained straw hat, bend down lower in the direction they're always bent, west to east. What are we going after again, Edie asks. It's a 1951 Chevy, Chevy it's a 1951 GMC half ton, low miles. How did you find out about it? It's Les Moore's uncles. The uncle had to sell his ranch so he doesn't need the truck. Doesn't anyone else want it? Hell yes, but we'll get there first. Ahead, a dust cloud high and thick enough to tint a corner of the sky, a darker blue swirls, and well before they draw close, they can taste its dirt. The hell, Roy says, someone's plowing something. Close the windows. They both crank up their windows, then Edie crawls over the seat to get to the rear windows. She has to swing one bare leg, then the other, past Roy's head, and he takes his eyes off the road to watch her make this climb. Stay back there, he says. You can roll them down again in a minute. As the windows close, the air changes pitch from a steady whoosh to a fast-paced thump, as if a propeller powered their vehicle. Then the interior suddenly quiets and their voices lower, as though they've entered a church. My God, Edie says and draws a deep breath. It's like the inside of an oven. I'm never getting a car again without air conditioning, Roy says. I swear it. Edie keeps one hand on the window crank. Your place gets plenty warm, doesn't it, says Roy. I told Dean, anytime you two need a good night's sleep, come on over and you can have my bedroom. Air conditioned comfort. You can't beat it for sleeping. And turn you out of your bed, where would you sleep? I can always find some place to bunk down. I bet you can. Or maybe you want your own unit. If the store has any left at the end of the season, they always put them on big sale. I could use my discount and get you an even better price. We'll let you know. Talk it over with Dean, Roy says, and then twists his head as though he needs to know exactly where she is in the back seat. We'll let you know. In another minute, the sky clears back to its undifferentiated blue. Roy says, you can roll them back down and get back up here. I'm not your chauffeur. The truth is, Edie would rather remain in the back seat, out of Roy's reach. These brothers. For some time now, Dean has acted as though he's been warned to keep his hands off her. Even in bed, he sleeps on a narrow space away from her. Meanwhile, Roy has been, well, Roy. Could it be that desire is something like mumps or measles, one brother coming down with it while it passes the other by? Edie points a finger straight ahead. Take me to the theater, my good man. And I'm sure as hell not your good man. As Edie climbs over the seat again, Roy reaches out a hand 
but whatever he was going to do, he must think better of because he puts his hand back on the steering wheel. Once she settles back into her seat, however, he takes his hat from where it's been sit resting in the space between them and tosses it into the back. Roy asks, you ever been up to Bent Rock? When I was a little girl, Edie says, my dad took us up to Canada, just drove across the border and turned around and came back again. So we could say we'd been there. Would we have gone through Bent Rock then? You might have, then I might have been there. Well, whatever you remember, it hasn't changed since. Edie slips off her flimsy rubber sandals and hooks her toes up on the lip of the dashboard. You probably get your feet dirty today, Roy says. I don't think Bent Rock's got but the one paved street. I thought I'd wait in the car. Hell no, I need you to keep them distracted during the negotiations. Really, what was Dean's job going to be? Drive, that's all, just drive. Roy takes a pack of camels from the pocket of his white shirt and shakes a cigarette up to his lips. He offers the pack to Edie, then pulls it back. I forgot, you don't smoke. He pushes in the lighter. A moment later, it pops out and he presses its glowing coils to his cigarette. He inhales deeply and when he exhales, the wind whips the stream of smoke out the window. Don't you have any vices, Edie? You know better than to ask me that. Roy turns his head toward her and with his finger slowly traces in the air the length of Edie's bare leg. Tell me something, he says. How do you get so tan working in the bank all day? Edie quickly lowers both feet to the floor. She says, we've got a folding chair we set up behind the building. During breaks and lunch hour, I sit back there and I'm out on the weekends, of course. I wouldn't think you'd get much sun in that alley. Roy pinches his cigarette between his lips and extends both arms. Me, I'm like a steak cooked on just one side. The car floats over the center line and Edie starts to reach for the steering wheel, but then Roy takes hold of it once again. About the only time I get out of the store, he says, it's in the car and then one arm hangs out the window and the other doesn't get any sun at all. The only other car visible on this stretch of highway is at least a couple miles ahead and then it vanishes, curving its way into the first of a series of low hills, each stitched to the next with a narrow dark strip of cottonwood or burr oak. Now you, Roy says, you probably have to hike your skirt up plenty high to get so much sun. He leans forward to look at her and maybe undo a button or two. She doesn't say anything. Of course, with those mini skirts you've taken to wearing, for God's sake, Roy, can't we have a normal conversation? Roy smiles the smile of a man confident of its power to heal or beguile. Why sure, Edie, what did you want to talk about? But she says nothing and turns her head away from her brother-in-law. She knows women whose husbands would never let their wives get into a car with Roy Linderman, but not Dean. No, not Dean. So there you have the novel situation, at least in the first section. You can see that the conflict that gave birth to, to the novel, a man in love with identical twins, has changed to fraternal twins in love with the same woman, though in these pages, it might seem more like lust than love on Roy's part. But even as I was writing the novel, it was undergoing a metamorphosis. I don't work from an outline, and I don't know how a novel will end. I don't even know how the scene I'm writing will turn out. But at some point, I trust that the material itself will provide some direction. If I thought I was going east, but something occurs in the writing that says go west, I'll go west. That means I have to be open to the kinds of surprises that lead to discovery. Discovery about my characters, about the world of the fiction, about myself, or about all of those. The biggest change, the way this story veered off in its own direction, was in character. I thought the Linderman twins and Edie Pritchard would share top billing. Before long, however, it became apparent that this would be Edie's story. She had the kind of depth and complexity that seemed worthy of exploration and development. Furthermore, as the narrative evolved, it became clear that Edie, the woman whom the twins loved, would not only dominate the narrative, but would also embody the theme of confused identity. But the confusion was not in how Edie saw herself, as it so hap often happens in contemporary literature, or in how she saw the Linderman twins, 
She has a realistic sense of self and a sure sense of who the brothers are, but in how others see her. Pragmatic, unpretentious, she knows who she is, but she's also beautiful. And beauty often blinds people to qualities of heart and mind that can be every bit as rare as beauty. As I came to know more and more about Edie Pritchard, I saw her as an extraordinary, ordinary human. That is, not someone famous or notorious, but someone with exceptional qualities, someone intelligent, courageous, loyal, and strong, but often underestimated. As I wrote, I also realized that my initial sense of the novel's length would not be adequate for me to explore Edie's character fully. I came to the first section, the end of the first section, which at one point I believed would be the end of the novel, knowing that there was so much more to Edie Pritchard. So at that point, my structural plan for the novel changed. And though I remained committed to my initial decision to use dialogue and action as the predominant narrative modes, the setting changed not just in place, but in time. And I saw that incidents in the first section could be made part of a pattern for the rest of the novel and for the rest of Edie's life. That pattern was to present critical events in her life at 20 year intervals. Each episode would involve a road trip. So many important moments for Americans occur inside our automobiles. And each would present Edie with critical choices about intimate relationships. The three parts would also contain elements that would parallel those in the other sections. My hope was that these episodes would reveal Edie Pritchard to be the exceptional woman I knew she was. Someone who was, as I mentioned earlier, smart, brave, strong, and loyal. And I hope that if you read the novel, you'll see and recognize her in exactly that way. So, now I'd like to move to the part of the evening that I most look forward to, and that's the conversation with you. Thanks so much for that, Larry. Uh, if you didn't, uh, if you joined us after the introduction, my name is Rob Gowdy. I'm the events manager for Friends of the Hennepin County Library, and I'm happy to be here on screen with Larry to guide us in the discussion portion of the evening. Um, so as we get started, I just want to remind everyone, if you do have a question, click that Q&A icon on the bottom center of the screen, enter your question there so that we uh, can go through your list of questions. Um, but just to get started, I thought we would ask um, a, a few questions just to set the scene here. Um, so, so Larry, I finished the book last week, and I, I have to say that I just really loved it. Um, even the characters that uh, you you don't necessarily want to like, I, I feel like uh, they kind of became my best friends. Um, so thank you for creating such a rich world. Um, and then speaking of the world, uh, much of this book takes place in Montana. And uh, there's this sense of kind of an imminent constant threat in this book. Do you find that th this threat is inherent to Montana? Or is it more specific to your story? Um, could I say maybe America? <laughs> uh, you know, I uh, this morning I, I did a, a, a podcast with a, a, a fellow in London who does a, a podcasts on books, and and um, he wanted to talk about guns. He said are they really always nearby? And I said, yeah, that might be true in some parts of the country more than, than others. And so there are guns in this book. There's not, there's not shooting, but the guns are there. And, and maybe that's something that adds to that, that feeling of imminent violence. I mean, these, these guns are in glove compartments, in closets, uh, you know, they're within arm's reach. And if you know that, even sort of in the back of your mind, maybe you know, oh, oh it, this conflict could really, could really get out of hand. And um, I think there's that. I think there's something about um, 
the cars also add a little bit of conflict to, um, you know, those, those relatively empty highways are perfect for um, uh, speeding along. And there's a, a, uh, an accident early on in the novel that has to do with, a, uh, with either a chase or a supposed chase. And it ends badly. Yes, indeed, and I, I do hope that all of you pick up a copy of Edie Pritchard because that, that chase does come to a, a rather thrilling conclusion that I will not spoil here. Um, and kind of an extension of that, of that first question, there's a certain mythology of the Old West at play in the novel. There's uh, the rugged individualism, the solitary expanses, uh, scores that are to be settled, and, and the casual yet brutal violence that you mentioned. Um, was there a conscious attempt on your part to play into this? And in what way were you attempting to shift the paradigm and play, play against the stereotypes of the Western novel? Um, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't conscious, at least it wasn't initially conscious. But at some point I knew that, that um, these characters, some of these characters would have um, uh, sort of Old West counterparts. You know, uh, Roy Linderman is somebody who's wheeling and dealing all the time. In an earlier century, it would have been horses and not cars that he was dealing. Um, the, the Linderman brothers head up to Bent Rock because they intend to have a showdown with these brothers um, they feel have, have somehow wronged them. Uh, later, there are a couple of brothers, no good brothers, who come into the story. Uh, uh, and, and those would have been the outlaws roaming the Wild West looking for the main chance. So, uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think there are um, Old West counterparts to some of these characters. Okay, I think at this point, we're going to go ahead and move to our growing list of questions from the audience. I'm just dying to hear what people have to say. Um, starting with a question from Pam, is there something in this new book that will surprise readers who are familiar with your other books? Does it take an unexpected path in some way that is unlike your other fiction? Um... Well, there are a few things that surprised me, so perhaps uh, in the writing, so uh, um, perhaps they will surprise readers as well. Uh, maybe the biggest surprise, I've made it right into the 21st century with this book. Uh, you know, there are cell phones. And uh, with my previous fiction, I was sort of stuck mid-century, and, and so this is a an advance in time anyway. You know, anytime I write a book, I always feel as though I'm, I'm trying some kind of experiment. And though I don't want the experiment to get in the way of the story, sometimes it's just something for me to sort of keep me on task and keep me alert. Um, but I've all, I'm, I'm always trying to do something new. And uh, then we're going to switch topics a little bit here um, and going into place. Um, before I ask the audience questions, just a quick question. Where are you now and how did you end up in the place you currently are living? Um, I'm in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin. And, and um, we moved here uh, three, three, three years ago. Um, and uh, there's somebody in the room who's coaching me on these. Uh, and uh, our, our daughter and uh, son-in-law uh, live here. They came, they came here first and we began to visit them. And uh, we just really liked the community and especially a part of the community. Um, and that's Harbor Park, which is where we live now. We're just a half a block from the lake, from Lake Michigan. And um, we're out there walking around the, the lake and around the harbor every single day, and um, it's wonderful. Well, you're certainly making me jealous, and it does sound much more bucolic than the settings of your stories, so <laughs> thanks for sharing. Um, so along the lines of place, we have two questions. 
um, from Nelson, how has growing up in North Dakota formed your writing? Uh, Nelson grew up 60 miles from you. And then following up on that, how did you choose Mo Montana as the setting of so many of your books? That was from Barb. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first one, uh, the second part of the question first, because and maybe fold it in a little bit. Um, those of you who are from the part of the world where, that I'm from, I grew up in, uh, I was born in Rugby, um, North Dakota, but grew up in Bismarck. Uh, those of you who are from that part of the world know that, that Western North Dakota and Eastern Montana are similar in many respects. But when I was writing Montana 1948, I wanted some sense of the frontier, uh, some, some, something about the, the Wild West as it might exist in the popular imagination if there, if there is such a thing. So I moved the setting of that, that um, story right across the state line and um, continued to set fiction there. I think some of it might be just because I've done the work of building the town, so I might as well get some use out of it. So I, I know which way the streets run in Bent Rock. I know where the Dairy Queen is in Gladstone. I um, know quite a bit about those towns. And knowing that, I think, is something that allows me to imagine freely there. Wonderful. Um, and then I have, I do have to ask about Bismarck, uh, which plays a large role in the third part of the book. Is Bismarck as terrifying as it sounds? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's a lovely town. No, great place to raise kids, good schools. Um, yeah, friendly people. No, no, don't rob, don't be frightened, no. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I won't. I will. I, although I have been to North Dakota, I have not visit, visited Bismarck yet, but I'll add it back to the list. But everyone, keep reading in Edie, Edie Pritchard because part three, there there are some pretty interesting things that happen in Bismarck. Uh, next up, we have a question from Corey. Are you ever haunted by any of your characters? Hmm. Yeah, sort of. I mean, not ghosts exactly, but every once in a while there's a, a character that um, I think that uh, uh, usually when I, I write a story or a novel, um, once I finish it, it, it goes away. Uh, but sometimes they stay with me. So for example, after I finished Montana 1948, those characters kept hanging around and I kept making up stories for them when I there was no longer any need to. I don't know if that's the same thing as as haunting, but um, yeah, they stayed with me. Um, certainly Edie stayed with me. I thought, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I thought that where the first section ends, I thought that might be the novel's end, but um, there, there just seemed much more of her of her story. And I have two follow-up questions based on, on that answer. Um, first of all, will we ever see uh, the characters from Montana 1948 again, since they seem to be haunting you? Mm, I don't have any plans in that regard, but you know, never say never. Oh, well, you know, we just had to ask. And then um, Edie Pritchard, um, we're, what was the first version of Edie? Like, what was the kernel of the idea for Edie? And when was the point when you decided um, to explore her further? Um, I think in, the, in that first section, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Linderman brothers are heading off to Bent Rock uh, to have a showdown. Um, and, and I think both of the brothers sort of feel as though they're doing it for Edie, that is to say, to impress her. Mm -hmm. The last thing Edie wants is for them to embark upon that, that mission. In fact, when they leave town, she attempts to follow them. She's willing to get out there and hitchhike in, in hopes of catching up with them. But as she's traveling in one direction, the brothers have turned around and she sees them coming back toward Gladstone and they're laughing. 
and uh, they don't they don't see her, but she realizes something about who they are and what their relationship is and what it will always be. And that's the point in which at which uh, Edie decides she's heading off on her own. And is she is she always running away from something or is she running to something? Oh boy, that's a great question. Um, um, well, you know, she she leaves Gladstone, her hometown, and yet uh, she returns in the second section. It isn't it wasn't her notion to return there for good, but she goes back to see um, uh, Dean, her first husband, who's mm -hmm. ill. And then in the final section, she's back in Gladstone. You know, I, I don't think of her as someone who's nostalgic or sentimental about her hometown. Maybe it's simply lack of opportunity elsewhere, a, a, a place she knows. And ironically, it's uh, a place where she's known, although many of the ways the people there know her, they're quite mistaken about who Edie really is. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I'm going to shift topics again because our, our questioners have, uh, we have Mary who's asked, can you speak to your process of revision? How do you revise your writing and, and how many stages does it go through? Um, well, as I said before, I, I, uh, I don't like to revise. I don't think I do it well. One of the reasons that I write very, very slowly is that I hope I'm getting it right the first time through and um, and then I won't have to make many changes. So, um, but once I finish a draft, I go back through it um, and, and do some line editing. I'm on the watch for episodes or scenes that could be, could, could be cut or could be expanded. Um, and then the next stage is, is uh, if, if the book finds a, a home with a publisher, the next stage is uh, working with, with an editor. And, um, edit, and, and my wife will tell you that there's a familiar pattern. The editor sends me a list of suggestions, even if it's not a very extensive list of suggestions, um, that I say, I can't do it. Oh, I, uh, no, it's impossible. I can't, it's, it's not that, that she's wrong about these things. I just can't, I can't do it. It's not within my ability. So I do this whining and complaining for a day and then the next day I sit down and try to attend to each of those suggestions one by one. And um, if, I, if there's something that I don't agree with, then I'll just say, no, I think it should, I think it should stay as it is. And I think um, picking up on your mention of your wife in the background, we have a great question from Carol next. I find it intriguing that male writers have interest and ability to get inside the thinking processes of female characters. Do you have females in your life who coach you? Uh, sure, <laughs> sure. Um, some of the, sometimes the coaching is pretty explicit, but mm, often it's sort of subtle. You know, um, uh, my wife and I have been married for 53 years, and we dated for years before that. So, um, yeah, I picked up a few lessons along the way. I mean, <laughs> sure. Um, I, I said in my acknowledgement for um, the lives of Edie Pritchard that, um, that my wife served as a sort of template for Edie. It's not that she is Edie. It's not that she has had experiences that are like Edie's. But often I would ask myself, yeah, would she do something like that if she were presented with those circumstances? And if I said yes, I felt as though I'd go, I could go ahead with it. Well, we're all very lucky that she served to be such a, a point of inspiration, if, if not directly, then at least in confirmation. Um, I do have another question here about, the, uh, about writing from Jeff. I'm interested to know how you chose present tense instead of past tense uh, for, from the reading earlier. Mm, um, I, I think it went with a few, with, with a couple of other decisions. I mentioned earlier that um, 
I decided on um, to tell the to try to tell the story with as much showing as I possibly can, with a minimum of telling, with a minimum of exposition. So that meant um, dialogue and action. Uh, a friend of mine recently read the novel and he said uh, it seems cinematic. And, and that was okay with me. That, um, um, that, that, that's a quality that I would want for that. And, and so the present tense seemed to go along with that as if all of this is playing out uh, right now, right in front of us. Um, I think based on that cinematic question, this would be a good time um, to answer the following question from Pam. Tell us more about the movie, Let Him Go. So exciting, Pam will be there watching and it's her favorite book so far. Although I bet she hasn't read it, you Richard yet. Uh, thank you, Pam. Um, it's, um, uh, uh, I mentioned earlier, the movie is finished. They hope to release it um, uh, August 21st, but with the world the way it is, they've had to delay um, that and will now, uh, Focus Features hopes to release it uh, in theaters, a general release, uh, November 6th. And my wife and I have seen it. The director and screenwriter arranged for a link to be sent to us so we could view it. And we just thought it was terrific. We loved it. And um, uh, I'd read the screenplay before. Uh, it's different because it has to be different. Movies are movies and books are books. Um, but the uh, director and screenwriter, um, I'm just so impressed with his talent. And uh, he, he, had a vision for the film, and um, I just thought remain true to it. It's got a great look, great music. Look for and us at the fancy restaurant scene. <laughs> and what's the new release date, Larry? It's November uh, November sixth. November sixth for the Let Him Go movie, so um, you can look forward to seeing that. Um, it seems like our uh, questioners here continuously come back to. Uh, uh, questions about writing. Um, so we're going to swing back in that realm again. Uh, Beatrice asks, with your process being so organic, do you ever start a short story which becomes a collection, which becomes a novel? No. Uh, well, I, I write very few short stories. Short stories are just very, very difficult for me. When I was in college, an undergraduate in college, I had a uh, writing instructor who said um, he stopped writing short stories because they were too difficult. Uh, novels were easier. And I thought, what? what? Did he just misspeak? Did he get that backwards? Um, but now I get it. Um, uh, novels, at least for me, are, are easier. Uh, and I think a big part of that is, is that I have difficulty with that, what to um, put in and what to leave out. Um, so, no, um, you know, I have written a few short stories, but short stories usually stay short stories. Although, once again, uh, my coach has pointed out to me that the stories that, that uh, comprise the book Justice all sort of grew out of Montana 1948. I thought I was finished with those characters. I wasn't. And... Um, and, you know, some people read uh, Justice a as a collection of short stories, um, but some have also suggested that it, that it works as a novel in stories. So that's a, a great recommendation. Those of you hankering for more Montana 1948, go back to that uh, book of maybe short stories, maybe a novel, Justice. I, that came out about five years ago, right? Uh, no, uh, just, Justice came out, I think, two years after oh, wow, 1948, yeah. yeah. Um, we've, we've got another fa fascinating question about the writing process. Um, this one about point of view from Jean. Please talk a bit about point of view. I get so confused when writing. I often mix them um, according to more knowledgeable writers in my critique group. Does the section you just read tonight mix point of view? How do you decide what to use and how, how must multiple point of views be handled? How do you handle multiple point of views? Uh, generally, with, uh, 
generally for me with multiple points of view, I try to restrict them to, to sections or chapters. So for example, in the novel, previous novel, As Good As Gone, uh, I'll have a, a, a chapter with a particular character as the focus of narration, as the point of view character, another chapter, a different character. Um, in the section that I just read, um, it's mostly objective point of view. That is to say, it's mostly dialogue and action. It's, it's what a camera would record. But there is a little bit of interiority. There are a couple of places where, where we get Edie's thoughts. So um, I would say that that's a section that, that, uh, that belongs to Edie and that for the most part, Edie is the, is the point of view character in the novel. But you know, if there's something in what you're writing that tells you you need to maybe mix the point of view, you know, there are novels that do it very successfully and to great effect, so don't be so sure that it can't, it can't be done. Thank you, I'm, I'm sure that answer is greatly appreciated. Uh, I, the next question is, is just kind of a fun one from Mara Lee. Uh, did you set out to write about a modern setting or did it just evolve into that when someone got on a cell phone call? Did you tell, I know you mentioned how the story evolved. How, how did you, how did you get into 2000? Is it 2007 or 2008? 2007, I think. Okay. 2007, yeah. Um, uh, no, I, sure, it evolved. I mean, uh, uh, once I, I made that commitment to telling the story of telling Edie's story at 20 year intervals, once you do 1987, you know what's got to come next. And, um, and uh, so once I started doing 2007, I, I um, knew I had to try to do the things that were true to life in 2007 and she had a cell phone. Although I think hers was a flip phone. I'm not sure if smart, I think smartphones came out in 2007, but Edie didn't have one. Uh, we're going a little bit back to a uh, sense of place again in the audience questions here. And I'm going to ask two of them at the same time because they seem related uh, from Candace. How do you keep track of physical details in places you may revisit? And then from Michael, do you visit Montana to gather material gain inspiration? He's a native of Glendive, Montana, and uh, he thinks you capture the spirit of the people in the landscape, especially in the eastern half of the state. Uh, did you say that came from Michael? That came from Michael, and then Candace, how do you keep track of the physical details? Um, well, first of all, thank you, Michael. Um, and um, this is this is a true confession time. Uh, my Gladstone is roughly Glendive, um, um, but again, you know, it's uh, I prefer to do the fictional communities. I mentioned the Dairy Queen earlier, so if it's Gladstone and not Glendive, then I can have the Dairy Queen on the north side of town without having to hear from readers who tell me, no, no, it's on the south side of town. And by the way, there isn't even a river there. Um, I, keeping track of, no, I don't go to Montana uh, uh, consciously to gather um, details or gather information. I trust, I trust my memory. I, I said at one point that I, I, I'm not sure if this is true, but uh, it might be that writers either write from memory or observation. And if that's true, you could put me in the memory camp. Um, um, details that have stayed with me. Um, I, I think of memory as a kind of filter. And if, if things stick in the filter, they did so for a reason. So I'll try to use those details, uh, even if I don't necessarily know what it is that they mean or what their particular significance is. Um, and as for remembering details, um, you know, once you build the house, <laughs> you, you don't have much difficulty remembering where the rooms are. At least I don't. 
Thank you for that answer. Um, we've got another kind of uh, fun question, this time from Mara Lee. Uh, is it hard to write about a character you don't like, or is it kind of an adventure? Uh, yeah, it, 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 it can be fun. <laughs> it can be fun. I was not particularly fond of um, Dean and Roy's mother, Mildred Linderman, but she was a, she was a really vivid character and uh, yeah, she was, she was fun. I mean, one of the great things about fiction is that you get to hang around people that you wouldn't want to hang around with in life. And uh, um, there are more than a few of those in, in uh, the lives of Edie Pritchard. And I, I think we've reached the point where we have time for one more question. Um, this is a question from Pam. Um, it's one that many people liked, so I, it's, it's on the top of everyone's mind. Do you think you might set a future novel in Wisconsin? Why or why not? Um, I, I, I do have a novel set in Wisconsin. Um, uh, Orchard is set in, in um, Door County. Uh, but my wife has noted that that I don't write about a place until we leave there, and then so we used to have a place in Door County. We sold it, and uh, and then once I we left Door County behind, then it became a setting for a fiction. So, sure, if we if we leave Wisconsin, it could very well uh, come back in my fiction. Well, we're going to have to find you some kind of a plane ticket to get out of there so that we can we can finally get our Wisconsin story. <laughs> well, listen, Larry, thank you so much for your time this evening. Um, it's been a, quite a freewheeling and wide ranging conversation. Uh, we're just so pleased to have you visit visit us at Talk of the Stacks again and for your support of Hennepin County Library. And I have just a couple of reminders before we finish up. Larry's brand new book, The Lives of Edie Pritchard, is available from our bookseller partner, Majors and Quinn. So you can click the link in, in the chat to purchase your copy tonight. Buy it tonight. Go to Majors and Quinn. You're going to love this book um, and all the lives of Edie Pritchard that you discover inside the covers. Also, if you enjoyed tonight's presentation and you would like to support Hennepin County Library in expanding the anti racist ebook collection, you can click that link in the chat or visit our website, supporthclib.org. On behalf of Friends of the Hennepin County Library, um, thank you, Larry, once again for coming. And thanks to all of you for watching. And everyone, please have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Yep. Good night, Larry. Good night.